Hey everyone, Ariel Adams here with Spending Time, the Blog to Watch podcast. I'm joined by David Bredden. Hey David. Hey everyone, how's it going? So we are talking about Basel World 2019, again, our favorite topic. And on this episode, we're talking a little bit about the innovations that we saw, like things that were actually new, new movements, new materials, new watches, things that are, are new, as opposed to minor revisions, line extensions, new cosmetic variations, and things like that. And you and I, before we started recording this, we're asking ourselves, like, what was really new? What what do we actually remember? And it's just been a few weeks, um, you know, after Basel, like a month ago, we were we were in Basel right now, uh, mm-hmm. doing our thing, seeing hopefully innovation. So like, I'm looking at the last page of things that uh, we have on here from Basel World, and there there just isn't anything here really related to uh, serious innovation um, that I'm seeing from the show what what do you what can you think of because i know that we talked we always look at rolex for example yeah. as being a bellwether of industry trends and things like that and rolex had no real innovation just nothing you know th- nothing that was really actually innovative uh there i'm looking right here at well, bulgari that had something but you know did you do you think that rolex had a new year or it's just sort of a pleasing new version year yeah, I, I think they were winning time this year, but what we have to respect is the fact that they're slowly rolling out their uh, latest generation of movements, you know, the 32, this and that, um, after the 31, 35, for example, it's 32, 35, and so on and so forth. So, And, and this trend started in 2015 with the date 840, and now the date 836 received it, and a bunch of other, you know, collections or at least types of watches are getting these new movements with a co- completely new architecture, um, extended power reserve, uh, extended service uh, period, and so on. And I think we have to respect that this this cannot happen, you know, from one year to the next. But um, over these last four years, those um, um, you know, of, of, how do you say, um, added values that were linked to this n- new generation of watches or movements, at least, they didn't fade away. They they are still as great to have as you know as they were four years ago. So of course, it's a four year old innovation in a sense, but you're just getting it in the new GMT Master Two or whatever. So in that sense, I think w- we have to respect that, and you know, we cannot expect something like that to happen, you know, from scratch, from ground up every you know four or five years. True. So that's what we're true. Saying. But again, I think people who are interested in buying things um, <clears throat> are definitely motivated and inspired by the world of technology where everyone wants to buy the newest thing, which which has a sense of the latest and greatest thing. And I think that we have that in the watch industry where the new things are valued. So we definitely look for those things. So Rolex yeah. had technically new products, um, re- but they were refinements. We'll call it that. Yeah. They were not revolutions. So Bulgari had a new movement. This was new. Yes. This was the world's thinnest chronograph GMT movement. It's also the world's thinnest automatic. chronograph. Autom- yeah, so the world's thinnest automatic chronograph movement also happens to be a GMT movement. Very it is cool. not it is not it is very cool. It's not a full 12-hour chronograph. It is a it is a 30-minute chronograph, but it has a pusher on the left side of the case, which is able to move the GMT hand, which has its own subsidiary dial. So th- the funny thing is this actually reminds me of some of those like more simple Seiko quartz chronograph movements that has like the synchronized uh, 24-hour hand as opposed to a full 12-hour chronograph. You know what I'm talking about? I know, but this one actually is a GMT, so it's not a synchronized. I, I know, I know, but like that's the first thing I thought when I saw yeah. this watch. I was like, oh, yeah, a little... Like- <laughs> a little homage to Seiko, because you know the Bulgari people are like, wait a minute, something else has a very similar layout. Yeah, that's true. That's true, but 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 I, I hugely respect this functionality that they added as, to this movement. It's it's absolutely incredible. And 55 hour power reserve too for such a slim movement. That that's pretty crazy. It really is slim. And here you can see the peripheral automatic rotor that goes around the movement. This is a wide movement, which is is basically how they're able to get around this stuff. And to people that are curious about why we're seeing so many thin movements these days, that's actually the reason. The 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 things that need to go into the movement are expanding um, outwards as opposed to being stacked on top of one another. So it's actually not easy, but a lot easier than you might think to make an ultra-thin movement today 
as opposed to a long time ago when not only did it need to be very thin, but it also needed to be in a much narrower case. So today it's a little bit more possible to add various types of complications and things like that. But even even with that said, um, don't you agree, David? There's prob there's not enough new thin movements coming up. You look at the Nautilus and you look at the Royal Oak, which are really popular because of their thinness. The Octo Finissimo yeah. as well. But other than Bulgari, I don't. And Piaget, mm, kind of, because they nah. haven't done too much stuff off. But who's making ultra thin sport watches? Well, um, there's a Giro Perigo Laureato that was really genuinely very slim. Even 20 years ago, it was it was as slim as any of those others that you mentioned. But of course, the Laureato is always dismissed. Uh, we talked about this a couple of shows shows ago. Um, for some weird reason, it's, it's dismissed. But that that is a genuinely slim watch, and I believe the new versions that they relaunched a couple of years ago, those also have like this sporty and slim profile in some of the watches. Not all of them, but I, I believe there's one or two of them in there that are properly slim. I'm continuing. Not as slim as this, though. I'm 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 literally on page five already of new Basel World 2019 watches still looking for something that is actually like represents something new. I mean there's just not that much. It is a very very safe year. Um am I wrong that I want novelty constantly? Like there's I I I asked myself that question with with what is there like several hundred brands? Am I wrong that I want to see novelty more often? I think you know the first question that comes to mind when when we, when I hear the word novelty or innovation in, in in the watch industry, I think to myself, yes, but at what price? So when you when you say innovation, what price do you at what price point do you expect it to happen? One thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, or two hundred thousand? So where is it that you're missing this from? Where is it that you would like to reasonably see more of it more often? I mean, look, we have a brand like Richard Mille, who not all the time, but is regularly trying new stuff. And they've gone so far as to use non-luxury materials in luxury ways. So we know they use this, the stacked carbon, for example, that I, I'm not saying it's cheap, but it's not like a million dollars expensive. Why is it that other brands can't do similar things? There's all these industrial materials out there that that can be tried, things that you could bring into the, the watch for the first time, yet it seems to be only the really big ones are doing it. Is it risk aversion? Uh, are they just not thinking outside the box enough? I mean, we look at Grand Seiko, for example, right here, and they had and they had you know they had a new case. There's a there is a genuinely new Grand Seiko sport watch yeah. case. It's not for everyone, um, and what we have here is a new style of dial. I, it, the funny thing is, more people are talking about the dial than the case, and which the case is, is, is incredible. So you're 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 a fa I, I I think I'm a fan of the case as well. I don't yeah. know that I'm a hundred percent sold on the dials yet. I love these dials. These Lions main dials, which are brushed. They look like brushed bronze or something like that. It looks very weird. It also looks like carbon fiber when it's forged carbon. So it's in between those things. And of course, Grand Seiko say it's like the Lions main because that's their logo and somehow they are attached to it. Which I guess is fine. It it doesn't really bother me. It, it it kind of reminds me of these like you know, fifty or sixty year old televisions and radio sets and whatever that were that had this wooden like box you know they were presented in. Oh it, yeah, it this like faux wood. Feel. Yeah, it has this retro feel to it, <laughs> especially with this case. So this is like a blast from the from the past in a way. But then again, it's spring drive, so it's super modern and it's super capable in terms of the movement. So. It's a mixed bag of, but it's super expensive. The Chrono was what, like twelve thousand? Yeah, twelve thousand nine hundred for the Chrono. It's over That's ten thousand for the three hand. Holy moly! I mean, what, I was happy these, to see that. What's that? Were these titanium or steel? Titanium. Um, titanium. Okay. Pretty well, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it was. I see it now. So yeah. not just titanium. Zaratsu polished mm -hmm. titanium. Zaratsu. You know, for people that don't know, all, all that means is that they're able to get a very consistent flat polish. So to get those really yeah. crisp lines where it doesn't blur light in an unattractive way, the polish not only needs to be consistent, meaning each stroke needs to look the same if it's brushed, and for its, if it's polished, of course, it needs to look uniform, and the surface needs to be very, very flat. And Rolex has been able to industrialize the technique to do a lot of that. Seiko has as well. 
Um, and a lot of brands don't do a very good job at that. But if anyone's curious about what Zaratsu is, so I mean, obviously every year Seiko has new watches. Grand Seiko has new watches. How long has it been since we've seen a new Grand Seiko sport watch? Very long time. We're, you know, there were these divers here and there, but to have a new case like this, I think that's very cool. So kudos to um, to Grand Seiko for that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm. Yeah, go but ahead. no, but but in terms of movements, we had like a manually wound spring drive. Um, I I think they came out with one. Yeah, it was in the last year. I I don't know. It's like. I feel like the the Grand Seiko that I know and love is turning into something else, and I don't recognize it anymore. And they said that they were just it was super successful for them, and everybody wanted these manually wound Grand Seikos. And I'm a big fan of Grand Seiko. I I really am. But I I did not realize there was such a demand for manually wound spring drive. I mean, does it does it surprise you to hear that? Because I'm just wondering like who is the brand selling to now? Well, when it comes to a brand expanding upon its collections and offerings, I don't really mind it too much as long as it doesn't come with a diversion from what it what made it great for me. You know, so if they want to do hand wound and they want to do dressy watches in gold for stupid money like twenty something thousand and thirty something thousand for one with this blacker dial, don't I don't forget like, wow, forty that's... forty something thousand as well. No way. So so, oh, yeah. so when I see that I'm like, all right, well, that hurts the brand in my in my mind at least. Definitely hurts it. But if they want to do it, okay. But just keep doing you know what made you great. And um, you know the Spring Drive Chrono that I have retailed for seven thousand seven hundred, and that was all the watch you could ever need. And then now we are looking at thirteen thousand for essentially the same watch in a different case. So it's almost double. It's like a seventy eighty percent price increase for the same movement in a slightly different non precious metal case. And when I look at that and I, I think to myself, like, oh, what's going on here? I really didn't like their diversion from uh, Seiko, their separation from Seiko, and now calling themselves Grand Seiko. That's where it all started. The price hikes and this weird marketing and this weird um, um, positioning of the brand now. I, I, I'm just confused. Like, like I, I don't know what to make of Grand Seiko, like you are, right? I, I just want to I, I give them time and see where it takes them. If it works for them, that's great. But I'm not gonna be buying Grand Seiko for thirty thousand dollars. I can tell you that. It's 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 a tough sell right now. We don't deny that the quality is there. It's a very good brand, but you just you don't jump up that high in price so fast without saying to your existing fans, "Hey, everyone, here's why, and here's what we got for you." It feels mm -hmm. like they very rapidly abandoned a core set of people that were very supportive of the brand, and now. They don't have that much to say to those people. So people who sort of became fans of the brand at lower price points, Grand Seiko just sort of says like, oh, you're still here? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That's not a nice message to send out. <laughs> well, you know, it's 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 not like they're adding a new level which is going higher. Just like everything is higher. Yeah. You know, it's... it's look, they're experimenting. They're trying new things. I, I, I like that for sure. Um... You know, the newest Rolex was the 42 millimeter wide Yacht Master. That was really the new thing. So weird. I I mean, this was a nice watch. It was fine. It's not very memorable. I mean, the thing is, does it fill a market niche technically? Yes. A, a, a two-tone, well, not two-tone, but a, bl a black and, and silver color, white gold Yacht Master with, the, it, it just, it looks like a sports watch. It's definitely a luxury watch. It, it basically is this year's, you know, FU watch from Rolex. Yeah, and also historically, what Rolex has been doing when they when they do something like this and they launch like a new size and or a new material or something new like that, they do it in precious metals. So it, you know, it's inevitable that we are going to see this one in oyster steel, maybe on a bracelet, I, maybe not. But this is gonna go down like in some other ways than it is now. It's it's so weird that it's this singular. Yacht Master 42 in this one single <laughs> configuration. I guess there is no like dial versions or anything like that. No, you cannot even configure it. I, I actually think it's really handsome, but the funny thing is, you know, you ask yourself why this is popular, and this is because the the Daytona on the Oyster um the the Oyster Flex bracelet yeah. was was wildly popular for them, and the smaller Yacht Master one was as well. 
but especially the Daytona on on the Oyster Flex. So they know but, that they can get away with selling more Oyster Flex. That's fine, but the Daytona looks expensive even on the Oyster Flex. This watch doesn't. This yeah, looks but, like fashion watch. But it's that's essential. kind of what the Yachtmaster always has been. It's like the guy that wants like a formal sports watch that is more expensive than it looks. Except for the 40 in Relasium. I had that on like I don't know, a couple months ago and I was really smitten by it. I, I I didn't expect to like it that much, but I was like, why would I buy a Submariner if I can have this? You know, with the uh, in in steel with a platinum bezel, um, with the, with a tiny little bit of blue on the dial and, and so on, and I really liked it. I, I genuinely really liked it. That was not on the Oyster Flex; it was on a steel bracelet. Um, hold on, I'm just trying to configure this. So yeah, but I see what you but I see what you mean totally. The Patek Philippe, the 5520P, may may have had my favorite new movement of the show. So their movements always have ridiculous names. What do they call the movement here? Um, oh, we did an episode on this not too long ago. This yeah, is the AL30-660SCFUS. <laughs> FUS. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a whole show where we talked about this watch, so you can listen to that. Um, this is the alarm travel time. But I just sort of want to send terms of innovation this is a this is an entirely new movement from an engineering perspective. I mean, yes, of course, Patek Philippe used a lot of elements of the existing movements, but I remember seeing through a presentation where they discussed a lot of the little systems built into this watch, and it's impressive. You know, that's the better side of Patek Philippe when you get to hear that they engineer movements to work, even if they make a very small amount of them. <clears throat> You have to have a lot of respect for the brand because we know some of their competitors that may have movements that look more exotic, but we know are definitely not putting as time as much time or effort into the engineering and the quality control and the testing and things like that. So, you know, we talked about that, but this was, you know, I, again, just sort of still thinking about the show it was about a month ago already. This movement still really, really impresses me, and I, I like to play with it. So do we see any of this transcend into, relatively speaking, more affordable Patek Philippe watches? Systematically, do we, do we see these little systems make their ways into, you know, like uh, watches sometimes, that don't have four crowns? Sometimes. I mean, the only part that makes the most sense to put in to a less expensive watch is the travel time system, which technically is in a less expensive watch. So that part sort of already exists. Point. The yeah. digital part of the watch, the way you set the alarm in the 15 minute increments. That's fun right. to use, but it's actually the, one of the less pretty parts of the watch, even though it's very practical. So, I wish it was watch somehow, that, that aperture. It's, it's just, you know, I, I, I guess we, we've been spoiled by these big dates of Lange and Glossets Oregon and a few others. So when I look at this, it just looks you know, tiny. You know, on, on the wrist, it's supposed to be tiny, right? It's it, it's not supposed to be very big. I don't know that we have our hands on for this one yet, but we'll get that up. But this is this was an impressive movement. It really was. It really was. Um, trying to think what else was there from... Hublot. What did we see from Hublot? Um, I, I really like this Ferrari. Um, it GT watches, um, even though there's not much innovation there. Um, but it's, it's still a very nice presentation of of, the, of these watches. I genuinely like these a lot. If you're a car guy, if you know Ferrari design, these are in line with Ferrari design. Way more than the tech frame was a couple of years ago. Way more. So if, if, you, if you know Ferrari interior design specifically, this is just that kind of quirky and yet cool and ergonomic and and recognizable. It's it's all sorts of spot on for the Ferrari GDI. I, I really like this a lot. Yeah, I, I think our only mention of this is in our our top products of the show article. We have so much watches that we haven't written about yet, but they're coming. Here's a picture of that Grand Seiko on the screen with the would you say Lion's Mane? <laughs> yes. I mean it's That's a it's a cool watch, but it doesn't it doesn't need to be that expensive. It just doesn't make sense at that price point. Mm. I, I, I respect the fact that it's... There we go. Okay. There's, there's so Hublot. Let, so let's look at it this way. Um, you know, getting back to the Grand Seiko. It has 416 parts. Over twice as many parts as there are in a Daytona. 
So this watch retails for the same amount of money as a steel Daytona. But this one is in titanium. It has a case that is way more complex to finish uh, than a Daytona. It has a dial that is more complex than on the Daytona. Are we talking about the Seiko? Yeah, the, the okay. Chrono. So it's the same price, but twice the components. Way more complicated of a movement. Uh, in, in some ways, it's, it's way more impressive. The 4130 and the Rolex is, is super impressive a movement but when you compare, you know, anything to a spring drive. I think, you know, the spring drive has to come away, you know, on top. So they just priced it into the Rolex, you know, Daytona price range. And it's actually, you're getting in ways more for your money. I, I like the Daytona a lot. But technically, if you just look at the technical details of that watch, it's way more watch for the same amount of money. So maybe we could argue that they were selling it for, for cheap, you know, a couple of years ago. So okay. once you, you look at it that way, I think it's still not that expensive if you compare it to a Rolex. Of course, it's not a Rolex, but hey, Grand Seiko is for those who can tell quality and, you know, uh, quality of craft, craftsmanship apart from hype. Look, so, R- Rolex is not, not just hype, Rolex is not just hype, but you have to, and again, you, you, it, the argument is with sort of the average consumer. It's not someone who's looking for watch quality because that's that's an artistic preference. People are going to ask themselves, does it help me get chicks? Is it going to make me look impressive in a business meeting? If I'm in a like a really bad situation somewhere, can I trade it for a plane ticket back home? And the Rolex is like yes on all those things, yet the Seiko is possibly no on all those things. And the, but, but it's those social... Seiko, they- va- yeah. Sorry Seiko is not I'm just saying Seiko has not convinced us that it can charge this much more that fast. I'm just I'm I'm saying that I strongly believe they have not convinced us yet. They may have a good reason. They haven't done a good job communicating it yet. Of course, oh, communication is a is a total disaster for for Grand Seiko, an absolute disaster. So, yeah, of course, they should be, you know, communicating way more about the prowess of the product because the product I think merits the price. But all those things you mentioned are not part of the price or what, you, what you're getting for your money with a Grand Seiko. But it's never going to be. You will never, ever be able to trade a Grand Seiko in the next 50 years for a plane ticket or get safe home from anywhere. But or put chicks with it. It's 2019, it's, though. That's the only reason to buy a fancy watch anymore. I mean, I'm oversimplifying mm-hmm. for sure. But you know, say, see what I'm saying? Like, I'm, I'm presenting a argument that may be foreign to the way you think about it, but is also in the specter of consumers for luxury products, extremely salient. They're going to be, it's basically like, okay, it's expensive and worth it, but who else is going to know? This is a symbol of my success and my status to other people out there. If they don't know what this product is, meaning if Grand Seiko doesn't go out there and tell the the masses how cool it is, how's anyone supposed to know when you have one is cool? Like Mercedes does a great job advertising that driving a Mercedes is for like cool people. You drive a Mercedes, Mercedes has told everyone else that sees you, by the way, that person driving that, you you should think that they're they've done well for themselves. Because for Mercedes sure that- doesn't just make a good car. They also make and export and market that message. So how many watches does Grand Seiko make in a year? A couple of thousand? Maybe 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 more? I don't know. It can't be that much. It can be that much. It can can be that much more than ten thousand. Does, my it, ma- mind. does it, it matter? It, it matters because because you can find you know a couple thousand dorks and nerds every year who don't really give a crap about status, but you cannot find eight hundred thousand of them like you know Rolex Rolex sales to those people who want to do all those things that you just mentioned. Grand Seiko doesn't want to be the next Rolex. It doesn't want to be the next status watch. Oh, they would wants- love to be. You, I, 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 you're right. Their behavior. When you when you look at it <clears throat> and you interpret it, basically says we don't care. But we we know the people behind the brand. They would be thrilled to be seen anywhere close to Rolex level in terms of perception, and then they would deserve it. They would deserve a a lot more than they get. We know the people, the Japanese brands. We know that they deserve more accolades. All I'm saying is that with the right investment in marketing. Seiko could yep. say it is a watch of classy gentlemen who are confident and who are cultured and who are well traveled and and no better than the average person. Seiko could well, do that, but they fail to and they may never. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm I'm infuriated. We we could we could fill an entire show on the on the screw ups of of, of Seiko marketing. I, I, I genuinely could do like a ninety minute stand up show all, all on my own. 
It, yeah. It's, it's unbelievable. Like to, David to live. To, to, <laughs> you know, to, for, for them to come to a point where they would be like, hmm, well, let's, let's, Let's paint this picture of the Grand Psycho owner who's cultured and successful and da da da. Right now, we are at the point where we are receiving 900 pixel wide pictures that are super pixelated of their latest products, and we receive them late, and then we we are not showing them at Basel. Like this GTR, this Nissan GTR watch, comes out like three weeks after Basel World, and we, not a single word about it. Not a single word. <laughs> Why even go there? They totally shouldn't even go. They, okay, so if, if there's. If David, there's a brand that should be in, in Basel, it, it's it's totally Grand Seiko and Seiko. So David Live is going to be one entire lecture series about Jager Lecoultre, one about Grand Seiko. What's the third lecture going to be about? What are the Rolex? Brands? Rolex. Definitely Rolex. Yeah. Breaded on gonna... Rolex. <laughs> Episode fourteen. Thankfully, no one would pay for that. So this is. <laughs> no, I think it's going to be a, it's going to be a great show. Uh, <laughs> Reservoir with the Hydrosphere collection. These were cool. I don't think you were in this meeting. These were freaking cool. I like the way those look. Yeah. It's you know what's interesting about it, and we'll and we'll quickly move on because I know that this the show is getting a lot of tangents. This watch is the first diving watch, mechanical one, in a long time. That I thought to myself, if you didn't tell anyone it was a mechanical watch, they would think it was actually a piece of diving gear, which was actually really cool. That's very cool. I agree. Because no other diving watch that I know and like really fits in to sort of today's scuba equipment. Like the Submariner yeah. and like today's scuba equipment, it, it's like a total contrast. <laughs> <laughs> if you think about it, right? Like it doesn't match anything else. It's like, you know, it's traditional looking. It's all metal. It's polished and shiny. Like, what does it match? Maybe a tank or something like that? You know, this maybe a tube here or there, some, like, trimming that's actually polished on today's scuba stuff. That's all true. That's all true. <clears throat> it's it's <laughs> it's funny because, you know, when, when we talk about, you know, diving gear, the argument that's bound to be in the comments is like, nobody dives with this stuff anymore. <laughs> of course. So it's, it's fun to have something that actually looks like, you know, there's – at least a tiny little bit of chance for them to to actually use it. Okay, so we'll we'll finish this episode talking about, about again. We're talking about actual innovation at Basel World 2019, and if you didn't get the point, there isn't that much of it. There's new stuff for yeah. sure. Um, this I guess is sort of new because now it's in purchasable purchasable wristwatch form. But Citizen has pushed the boundaries again on accuracy and the zero one zero zero movement which is light power, it's an eco drive, is accurate to one second a year. And somehow being charged by light gets away with being an 8.4 megahertz movement. Yeah, we should have mentioned that first thing actually, but it, that thing came out, technically they debuted it last year, but uh, they presented it in, in wristwatch form this year. So of course that's the number one major innovation, in my mind at least, uh, for, for 2019. We're just... Like we said in the beginning of this of this show, we were so burned out from Basel. We, we, we were just, it took us this long to realize. But I, I'm very glad that you brought it up because I think that that definitely deserves, in my mind, the most innovative watch award of Basel 2019, the Zero 100. I have to what say, well, it's it's been one of the watches that I've most looked forward to wearing. Mm -hmm. And even though there was not a ton of innovation at the show, and I said this, I think, in a previous show maybe I did maybe I didn't but I walked away from this year's Basel World wanting to wear so many things more so than pretty much any other show I've remembered in a while and that was a good feeling that's true that's true none of the, and not all of them were super innovative but this goes to prove the point and I think this is a nice this is a good point to close on that um you know, we don't always want to wear, or you know, it's not always the most innovative watch that you will necessarily want to wear. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So just because something is bonkers new and and, and never seen before, it doesn't really mean that you will want to scrape the paint off the wall and, and say I want it so much. The the Zero One Hundred is one of those watches, but not all of them are. I mean, new. Let's be honest. New watches that are very very novel for the first years of their life are commercial failures. So this is something that we we know is is a real thing. Yep. Uh, we just have to 
also be cognizant of the fact that it takes a brand investment and effort and they got to dedicate themselves behind a new movement or collection or something like that. Um, they, they definitely have to feel as though they can eventually see money out of something or else they won't do anything about it. So we tend to see very, very safe bets. But I think that'll change in the future. I think brands will start to get a little bit more experimental. I would love to see that happen once they have proper direction. It'll happen. Okay, so this has been the Spending Time episode on actual innovation at Basel World 2019. I will say just finally, there are a lot of things coming on the horizon. There are a lot of technologies and materials and things like that the watch industry can make use of and has available to it. It has to make decisions about what it wants to industrialize. But I would not say that we are in a boring time for mechanical watches. There's actually a lot that can be done if the industry is willing to invest. We'll talk to you all next time.